Well, first of all, welcome ladies and gentlemen and children. The heritage of this site is that we are actually on the original Downey site for NASA, for Rockwell, North American Aviation, the home of Apollo, the home of the Space Shuttle Program. And at its peak in the mid-60s, we were almost 25,000 employees here at the site. But as time has changed and uh, moved on, the site has changed as well. And so we were able to lobby with NASA and the uh, uh, GSA and the property owners to make sure that there was something as a legacy that would remain on this property. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here today. We're going to explore what it was like and uh, try and find out for our younger people in the audience what it might portend for the future. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Ed Smith. He was the Vice President and Chief Engineer on the Apollo Command and Service Module for Rockwell International here at Downey. He was assigned to that position right after the Apollo 1 incident in Florida and continued clear through to Apollo 17. As Vice President, Chief Engineer, and later Chief Program Manager, he managed the design and the manufacturing of all the Apollo and later the Space Shuttle Orbiters up to that time and continued through the successful early flights of those missions. He retired from Rockwell Space Division in 1985 and in 1986 decided that, like I found out, retirement's not all that great. So he went to work uh, on the, uh, for Northrop on the B-2 program as Vice President of Engineering in Advanced Programs. Um, he retired finally again, that's his second retirement, right? Twice uh, from, the, uh, from that program. And uh, at that time he was vice president of the B-2 division and the program of the uh, stealth bomber. This morning, Ed has graciously accepted and to join us to remember and reflect on some of the Apollo program as we honor the 50th anniversary of that program. So I, I guess, Ed, the first question I have for you is one I get frequently as well. As engineers, we all had those early little experiences and pushes that, towards our career in engineering. For me, it was uh, Jules Verne, Flash Gordon, and my dad's garage going out there and tinkering. And that drove me to engineering. How did your interest in aerospace actually begin? Well, it probably just goes back before that. My my mom and dad were both uh, uh, engineering oriented. My mother was a uh, 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 architectural draftsman, which was pretty unique for those period, that period of time. Sure. And my dad was a, a forestry engineer and uh, uh, a 100% disabled vet. So uh, we moved to California in... Um, Oh, it's uh, 30, 1930. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents always talked to me about being an engineer. It was just day one. <laughs> I never thought anything different. And uh, fortunately, we, we ended up uh, living in the Venice area. And uh, it, of course, we all remember the old Santa Monica plant uh, up on the hill mm -hmm. uh, where they built the uh, well, DC-3, DC-4. Mm -hmm. At 13, I started, uh, for 14, excuse me, 15. Fifteen, I started a prog program that uh, I started to work with a program where we they took guys out of high school and uh, put it, put them to work in the uh, uh, industry. In this case, the Santa Monica plant, uh, the Douglas plant, and uh, we, they were desperate for people to work mm -hmm. during the war, tail end of the war particularly. So, uh, and I had some skill as a draftsman. What my mother had taught me. My first job was a uh, uh, well, we used to, we used to uh, lay out all the airplanes on uh, vellum, mm -hmm. and to preserve that vellum, they inked them. My job was to ink it. And you guys ever did any drafting in the old days? Inking is a pain in the neck. <laughs> and uh, so I worked at that for a while, and I ended up uh, going back on, uh, in the, on the uh, line working as a riveter and uh, worked for the next couple of years as a riveter and uh, 
until I went in the Navy. Uh, so I worked for three years at Douglas uh, uh, while I was in high school. So basically, that kind of set the stage for where I was going to go. After the Navy, I, uh, uh, my dad uh, uh, saw what I was going to do. I was going to end up being a beach bum. <laughs> so he took all my credentials, stood in line for hours, I swear, and uh, got me registered at UCLA. And that's how I ended up in UCLA engineering. And so if, if anybody pushed me, it's my old man. They have a habit of doing that <laughs> in many different ways. What was it like when you first started working in the, in the actual aerospace industry? What were those days like? Uh, for all you young guys that are looking for a job in engineering, look back. Uh, we all, as college graduates, we uh, went into the plant on a badge, what they call the, on, a, on the clock, and uh, we're literally draftsmen. This is a college graduate is a draftsman. You can imagine a college graduate going into <laughs> engineering field today yeah. and on, on the clock. So anyway, that's the way we started. We used to, I, I still remember the LA plant was, uh, which is where I first started to work. The engineering bay was a, a mezzanine, remember? Mm -hmm. And you could just see every engineering, and everybody was on the board or on a desk in, in view. You, everybody, the chief engineer walked down the aisle, he knew where everybody was. And uh, so there was a big bay, just a huge bay up above the factory. You looked down on the factory. And now, of course, you couldn't get an engineer to work in that. What was your earliest memory of the Apollo program? When I moved to Downey, of course, we'd, we'd been, I'd been working on uh, B-70 at the time. Mm -hmm. B-70 was a beautiful airplane with a lot of unique development. And so Apollo would look like a peanut compared to, yeah. uh, and, and, and even in terms of development, mm -hmm. until you really got into it in depth. Uh, above and beyond that, I came from the, fa the LA factory airplane. We built thousands of airplanes. We had discipline out the kazoo. Mm -hmm. you, know, you knew how to handle engineering to the floor. Apollo had nothing. We had no discipline at all. Yeah. Well, I, that's not fair. <laughs> Not good discipline, and uh, so I was kind of shocked in the sense, independent of engineering, the fact that uh, uh, it lacked the whole program lacked a lot of uh, hard nosed skill, and, and as typical, we see, even see it today, mm -hmm. we, uh, we got a brand new program, big money behind it, we're in a brand new building, with a bunch of guys that scattered from all over the world. We're putting this thing together, along with trying to build a unique vehicle. We're trying to m marry this manufacturing, engineering conglomerate. And see, like you say, 45,000 people is a tough job putting them together. I don't know how many engineers we have, 4,500 engineers? From my perspective, why I had that perspective, I don't know, but uh, I immediately recognized where the real problem was, at least my, my point of view. Mm. We had just a job getting the place together. Yeah. And it was interesting enough because when I went on the B-2, I had the same problem. Brand yeah. new building. Uh, and you can just see what happens. And it costs a, a, a big effort, mm -hmm. assuming you have the talent to do the engineering. And without computers, without... Uh, mm -hmm. Just slide rules and pencils. Slide rules and pencils. And the board. And the board. A lot of similarity between our careers. I also had started over at LA Division on the B-70. Uh, did a little bit of work on the X-15, but what I remember about the B-70 was we all got caught up in that closed shutdown when they canceled the program. But I remember the engineering on the B-70, uh, we were dealing with a lot of tangibles in terms of it was an aircraft. It's just that we were going to make it fly a lot faster. It was a lot bigger, it was just huge. And so we were breaking a lot of ground. And one of the areas I had been working on was how to seal those external, uh, the wing tanks, and how to seal them. And so a lot of that technology and experience that we had became very valuable for the Apollo program. And I came over here in 64 from uh, uh, LA, and I noticed that uh, it was the same thing. I mean, we had people in the hallways with desks because there, weren't enough, there wasn't enough room for everybody. Uh, 
But the early days of this program, the Apollo program, nobody had built anything like this. I mean, we had Mercury, we had Gemini, but this was a, a large spacecraft, three men. And it was going not just or, suborbital, it was going to have to go to the moon and come back. So a lot of the challenges uh, that we faced, as you mentioned, Ed, which was the, uh, the, the people, the staffing, uh, uh, reading and un interpreting NASA's specs in terms of what it was they wanted. Um, I'd like for just a minute to explore how did you find our relationship with NASA in those early days when we, they weren't sure what they wanted. They couldn't make up their mind whether they wanted to land it in water or, or the <laughs> land. Uh, but we had to help them every every step of the way. But we were help or fight them. Yeah, we were in an awkward position. Uh, do you have any memories of some of the challenges we faced with uh, NASA there? Well, see, my time uh, McDivitt was his program manager. Okay. Low had gone. I, I I personally didn't have any real problem. I uh, mm -hmm. I think we had a lot of. Uh, uh, well, if you look back into the details of history. We had a lot of uh, people who want, who from NASA and our guys mm -hmm. who wanted to run their own program. Yeah, the engine guys wanted to run their program, uh, so forth and so on. And uh, we had to, that discipline had to go get go away, mm -hmm. or lack of discipline. And uh, so the biggest problem we had was, and, and I think after when I got there after the fire, mm -hmm. it had been recognized that that some of that had to stop. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had the the authority to stop it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, it was George Jess on board, who was one tough son of a gun. <laughs> and uh, uh, we got together and drew the rules, put the rules down, and, uh, and who was going to talk to who, and who was going to tell who what to do, and, and uh, eventually got to a point where uh, it was a smooth run program. Mm -hmm. It took us a while. Yeah, the, the problem I recall was that there was a lot of freedom early in the program, and we were exploring whole new areas of technology. Yeah. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, I've commented frequently that uh, one of the pleasures of working on the Apollo program was that, that freedom and the ability. Uh, being an engineer, your job is very simple. Solve problems. That's what you do. You live to solve problems. And so we had them every day. And so to get up in the morning and say, oh, what kind of failures and problems am I going to get today that I have to go solve, uh, it made for an exciting environment. But there was another aspect to that environment, and frequently people have asked, how does, uh, what's been the real benefit of the programs like Apollo to us today? And the, the trite answer to that, I think, is, well, we've got our cell phones and we have all this new technology that came out of the program. But I would venture and I, I suggest that from our experience, I think the real value of the Apollo program was learning how to manage and integrate complex systems. Big factor. And you certainly were part of solving some of those problems. Although I like the other ones. <laughs> God, can you think of all the problems we used to solve? Solder balls. Uh, God, I can think of a million problems we solved. Oh my gosh! Anytime we get two engineers together, you're going to have hours of of stories about these problems that we had to solve. But that's what I think made this program so significant, because when we actually got to the the lunar missions. You, those problems weren't there anymore. Well, we beat them to death. That's right. They weren't there, for sure. In fact, that whole philosophy uh, drove all the way through Orbiter, and, and as many people who've been through Orbiter know, uh, it really paid dividends there. Because yeah. we, you know, we, we had learned so many things not to do that uh, we eliminated a lot. Well, we did eliminate a lot, a lot of those. And... Uh, I was kind of, kind of curious sideline. I, uh, when I went on the uh, B-2 program, the Air Force came to me and they sat down and said, Ed, we know what you did on uh, Apollo and Orbiter, and, but we can't afford to do those kind of things. If we're going to have a failure, we'll just come home. 
<laughs> in, in our bottle or, uh -huh. and he couldn't come home with those we had to we had to fix them before we left before you left and as part of our experiences in the apollo i i think that I, some of the most memorable to me are the people the people that we worked with i mean apollo was more than than just uh engineering and and drawings it was the people you had to work with every day at all levels um is there any one particular person that stands out in your memory and career of Apollo? Well, George Jeffs. Okay. He he's a mean son of a gun, but and tighter, and you know he thought every dollar was his, and <laughs> and as most of you guys remember, but uh, he drove us. Well, the kind of problems we're talking about. He drove us. You you couldn't uh, you couldn't do anything in a failure sense without having going through him and ring, having it wrung out. And I mean, ring out. He really wrung it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so by the time we got to the FRRs and those kind of stand-ups, uh, pre-Apollo -pre flights, we knew everything that ever happened. And, and uh, uh, I think he was a driving guy. He just, he just uh, there was no limit letting up with him. One of the thing, uh, major contributors I felt to the program success was... Uh, the uh, safety factors that were put imposed on us by NASA for all this hardware. Uh, this was man-rated space hardware. That means uh, everything that you did, uh, human lives were going to be in, in the formula, in the mix. And so uh, several times we were taking components, uh, we were taking designs, and you would design them and take them to a safety factor, and then they'd say double it. and. Uh, uh, we want to put redundancy in the system, and all this, of course, built to the complexity. Um, do you think that was uh, a significant contribution to the success of the program? Well, was, I wouldn't put it in terms of safety factors. Redundancy, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think, uh, I still back to my point of view, it says that we just watched everything in great detail, mm -hmm. and uh, and wrung it out to the last degree. I, I, I can remember stories that, God, with the money we spent to make sure that it wouldn't happen again, mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff that uh, got us there. Okay. Not, uh, we, yeah, where you had to, you know, maybe if it boosted the safety factor, but that was a, you know, we were out looking at weight, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just didn't give away weight. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's attention to detail that, 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 that brought uh, Apollo to its best performance, and, uh, and certainly Orbiter. So in your career with the Apollo program, what would you say is the proudest moment for you personally as a result of the Apollo missions and the Apollo program with Downey? Oh, boy. <laughs> it's a loaded question, I know. I don't know where you draw the line. Somewhere, uh, of course, obviously, the first flight. Yeah. Big emotion. Uh, as, as the flights continued, our ability to uh, respond to problems real time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those of you who had to live in the program uh, during a flight, uh, NASA had their flight control. They had behind that, they had another set of people that were all the experts to back up uh, decisions that were maybe off normal. Mm -hmm. And then we had a backup crew in Downey, which essentially included our entire engineering force. Mm -hmm. And we were really the, the, the prime source of data mm -hmm. because we had it all. Yeah. Uh, I can remember when it was Apollo 9, where we had the uh, resistor failure on one of the main engine actuator, mm -hmm. and uh, they were about to board the flight. George was in uh, in flight control at uh, Houston, and I was in Downey. And so they were going to board the flight based on ground rules that the flight directors had put together. And uh, this was what, Borman's flight, I think? Nine? Um, nine? It was. Uh, anyway. I think it was McDivitt's. Oh, well, all right. Anyway, we. Uh, Turns out, dug down into the group, and one of the engineers came up, and he'd done a, a failure analysis on this particular, fa this particular uh, uh, 
resistor that failed and, uh, and determined that it was stable. The system would be stable. Root locus. Remember root locus? <laughs> and uh, anyway, we found an actuator in the uh, lab or in a warehouse, dug it up one night, brought it in the lab, failed the unit, and uh, failed the resistor and uh, uh, proved that it was a stable situation. It would not be a flight hazard and canceled the report. You know, that's the kind of stuff we did yeah. day and night. You know, uh, I remember a lot of these problem-type activities. Um, we had, and I participated in several myself, we had our Tiger teams. We used to call them the Tiger teams. And a problem would pop up like this, and what you would do is you would, you would have the, the managers decide, okay, I want you, 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 and you. Go take care of this. Get it done, whatever it takes. Uh, I've often felt that uh, I, I don't know if they still use Tiger teams in the in the industry, but these were one of the most valuable tools that we had in terms of solving those kinds of problems. Um, is there any one particular Tiger team that you remember that uh, was responsive to something uh, other than the one you just described, of course? Kind of dozen something. But I'll, I'll show, give you a classic one. Okay. We had a, we were of course Apollo, after Apollo 13, we we're super sensitive to cryos, mm -hmm. and uh, some guy was working in one of the techs at the at the Cape was working in the in the cryo lab cryo bay, and uh, we developed a leak in in uh, one of the cryo of, uh, uh, control panels and where he'd been working. And he uh, declared that he knew a cold well when he saw it. And that's what that was, a cold well. And so what we did was, you can't believe it, I mean, we uh, found the original uh, solder, or I think it was soldering, not, not the weld. We found the original solder, put together a whole set of, uh, of uh, samples Took them to the lab, strain gauged them all to get, and and uh, determined uh, that the, the the wells were good, uh, the solders were good, and that uh, it, was, it had plenty of capability. But we also determined what would fail it, and then we literally set up a, a setup in the in the, in the test high bay with a service module, and and the uh, cryo bay. And brought this guy back from the Cape and had him do exactly what he thought he did, which was bump this little tube with his elbow. Mm -hmm. Had it all strain gauge and determined that he'd really banged the crap out of this thing. <laughs> and uh, that was, he'd broke it. Yeah. If you worked on the program uh, for Apollo, there was at least some point in your career and time that you're going to be on the road. Did you have to do a lot of traveling as part of oh, your, yeah. your job? And what was the part that you like most about traveling and the part you like least? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like dealing with the subs. I, you know, we usually never went to one unless it was a potential problem or a problem. Mm -hmm. So it was always a big exercise. To, fortunately, on Apollo, we, we didn't fight the dollar. Yeah, yeah. Which may be good or bad, but uh, <laughs> we, did, we did have to be what had to be done and do it right. Because there's no way you can do anything else. Uh, so that gave us a leeway that, uh, that perhaps wouldn't be normal in, uh, say, an aircraft program. Mm -hmm. Other than the time away from home and, uh, and the travel itself, of course, travel was different in those days. Yeah. It wasn't uh, like it is today. Uh, I, enjoy, I really enjoyed the travel and the chance to firsthand see uh, what the vendors were doing. Mm -hmm. It made all all kind of difference in both uh, the day to day dealing with them and uh, and your understanding of their problems as well as ours. Uh, it was a very complex vehicle. Uh, yeah. And for yeah. a little bitty thing, it's uh, very complex. One of my experiences with working with the subcontractors was in the early part of the program. Uh, I'm going to use the term my choice of words. Uh, subcontractors were tolerated. Uh, you had to have them because they did certain things and the government required us to have subcontractors to a certain level. But later in the program, 
uh, my experiences and I think of those of others was that we began to realize how important it was to work with our subcontractors as team members. And so the teaming experience became uh, much stronger and uh, very different later in the program. Speaking about teaming, I think this is another contribution of the Apollo program to, to as our legacy, is the fact that uh, uh, programs as complex as Apollo are not going to be built with isolated groups. It takes a team. And I would think that a lot of the early experiences in Apollo were learning how to build those teams and make right them work. Right would you comment about the teaming aspect of the Apollo program? Well, uh, maybe you're getting out of line, but uh, my personal experience is on B-70, which is a pretty complex program, mm -hmm. I actually spent the last three years of my career traveling to all the trouble spots. Mm -hmm. And so I, I developed a capability, I think, to deal with subs, which was probably uh, uh, to my benefit when it came to Apollo. So, and I made point... Uh, I made I pushed. I'm sure George suggested too. Uh, the, the the issue of constant uh, communication and dealing with the subs, not treating them like second tiers, because mm -hmm. they were a very important part of the program, and any one of them could get us. Yeah, yeah. How about the team experience here at the Downey site internally? Well. Uh, like I said, when I first got here, it was a problem, <laughs> I felt. Yeah. But I have no doubt that as we evolved and we did, and I think that experience shows on Orbiter. Yeah, we always had, at least in the early days, being as large an organization as we were, you had functions that had to respond to specific tasks. So you had the engineering departments, you had the quality department, you had the logistics department, you had the manufacturing department, and they all had different responsibilities. And they all, because of their size, tended to cluster in their own groups. Uh, it became evident to me later in the, uh, actually it was this was part later in the shuttle program, when we were looking at the implementation of MRP into our systems, and uh, I set with a a different, a, a functional, diverse group, and we had to come up and decide uh, what was uh, the best part numbering system for our hardware. And so every single function said, well, it's clear our part numbering system that we use is the one that's going to be the best because every function had a different part numbering system. So you would take a part and the first one group puts their number on it and then the second group puts their number on it. By the time you're through, you've got a number that would choke a horse. So what we agreed to is we all agreed that we would work together as a team and come up with a new system that worked through the whole process. It, it suggests uh, the value of something that I think became part of, of the Apollo program called systems engineering. The idea of taking all these different elements, but working them and seeing them in an end-for-end -end perspective. Um, if I recall, early in the Apollo program, like you said, it wasn't there. It was just a catacomb of different people trying to figure out what's going on and what they're going to do. But eventually we did get to integrated approaches and systems. Oh, yeah. Do you think there was a particular motivation that created that, uh, that choice? I want to get in trouble. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. I, uh, Chris, I'm a, I'm not a, I'm a strong advocate of system engineering, but I'm a, I have a different, a little bit different version. Uh, and I think we evolved the correct one mm -hmm. in, uh, in the, 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 uh, Evolution of Apollo and Orbiter, uh, which is basically every design engineer is a system engineer. Every every manager and supervisor is a system engineer. Uh, to, to there are various versions of uh, system engineering, 
and some of it's good, but uh, and, 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 there's a, and there's a bigger picture that's really system engineering, like a CDR, PDR, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff that really is important. And uh, uh, but fundamentally, to have like a lot of people think of system engineering as a guy who can stand over here alone, <laughs> and he's the overall system engineer. And uh, he can make judgment, and this is the way you ought to do it. Okay. No way. The only guy that's any good at it is the, is the design engineer. The basic design engineer, he has to be a full system engineer. Mm -hmm. And if you can't evolve that system, you're never going to get it totally. Uh, well, that's hierarchy, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I made it work. Yes, it did work. You know, I remember it from my experiences there, it, it worked. There was one area that was always a challenge, and I'm going to get myself in trouble now by mentioning this, but there was always the challenge as a uh, uh, supervisor, line engineer, in dealing with the project office. <laughs> uh, I realized Smith's they, boys. Huh? Smith's boys. Yeah. They, they served a very important function because I certainly didn't want to do the head banging and the n <laughs> uh, number crunching that they did. But they were also very frustrating when they would come to me and say, we have a contract change requirement, and here it is, and by the way, this is how many hours you've got to do it in. And I had no input to that. Um, well, I grew up in LAD. Oh, uh, okay. And LAD has a project office system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, if you're a chief engineer and you're trying to run a program and you're one guy and there's 4,500 engineers, and you try to keep track of everything that's going on and yeah. whether it feeds into what you see is the big story because you're the guy that's really looking at where you're going. Mm -hmm. And the only one that's looking at it, maybe, maybe a George Jess or somebody over your shoulder, but yeah. uh, uh, you need somebody to, mm -hmm. to integrate that piece. Yeah. And to have a group of guys who are super loyal that are committed to uh, your vision and hopefully your vision is the right vision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you need them. And they run interference with the customer. So and and they, they have, well, they were more than just uh, engineering. You know, they were the liaison yes. with manufacturing. Right. They, they were the primary feed between uh, engineering and uh, manufacturing and quality. Mm -hmm. And so a good ones, the good ones did uh, uh, a good system engineering job. Yes. Oh, they, a, a good project. In my project. mind, they were a piece of the system engineering. Yes. If I if I talked to system engineering, uh, and I had to sell it several times on on uh, P two, mm -hmm. I you know I, I I was always missing the piece on P two. Mm -hmm. Never did have that complete project engineering piece. Uh, I'm sorry that the project engineers were tough on you, mm -hmm. but uh, well. I, I think I learned from the experience too. Uh, it, it added to my uh, my lessons learned and skill set. As we mentioned before, the, a program like Apollo is just uh, would be unmanageable if it wasn't for the structure and the integration and the people management side of it. And in in all aspects, if you were responsible for any management component you had to rely on certain people that worked for you. Uh, for myself in the material control section, uh, I had one individual uh, that was just the backbone of, of the organization. We were about 35, 40 people. And uh, one day he came into my office and we got into a very heated discussion about a particular topic and a decision that was going to be made and so forth. And it got very vocal and heated. And uh, after he left my office, my secretary came in and she, uh, she said, are you going to fire him? <laughs> and I looked at her, she was rather young, and I said, why would I want to fire him? And she said, well, you, the way you were yelling and, and arguing and screaming, I said, that's what I pay him for. <laughs> He's got to tell me when I'm off track and not doing things. And I said, that's part of our, our process. He was a key person to our organization. Uh, did you have any, any 
anybody on staff that was key to implementing and managing uh, the program at that at that time? Well, Chief Roger had there. Yeah. But he was primary. His primary function was the uh, that manufacturing engineering interface. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, on Apollo, I had a lot of them. Yeah. I can think of a number of guys, a couple of men here, <laughs> that used to give me all kinds of crap. <laughs> and the one thing I learned, the one thing I got away with when I went to uh, Northrop and we were into a different environment, is the one thing you better remember, you listen to every one of them. Mm -hmm. the, what they have to say, and if you don't have a good argument, and of course I had a whole army to back me up to counter the argument, but there are guys mm -hmm. in here that win every time. Yeah. No, I can know a guy here is <laughs> terrible. I find a lot of people are surprised when we tell them that every astronaut on the Apollo program came here to Downey. Yeah. They were part of they, the... They had a piece of the program. They had a piece of it. They were part of the engineering process. The designs were not just our designs. They would actually crawl in those vehicles with the engineers and decide positions for switches and locations. Demand changes and demand changes and demand exactly. changes. Exactly. Oh, changes, changes, yes. That brings up another question I just want to touch on. The, uh, there was always this thing about the w engineering, the design engineering department would interpret the first blush of requirements that came out of the customer from NASA. And this is what we want. And the design engineer puts it on paper, creates the drawing, and then hands it over to the manufacturing engineer and says, well, here's the design. Now you go build it. And in many cases, that was a, a rub, because how do I build this thing? You've got requirements in here. They don't have a machine that big or, or whatever. In the early days, and again, I think it was con con the contribution of all the confusion and the uh, things that were going on, uh, it, it was understood that there wasn't enough interfacing between the two departments to make sure that you had products that were coming off the drawing boards that were going to be product out of the shop. But we continued to grow and get better and better at it. Uh, later in the program, we started talking about, especially when we got into shuttle, about concepts like concurrent engineering, where, gee, wouldn't it be great if a manufacturing engineer sat with a design engineer and they could do it together at the same time. So what was happening was an evolution of tools uh, in the initial days, as you described. When it's on the board, you've got to draw it all out. That takes time. And so the time from concept to a physical drawing that could be processed by somebody else thank you, would take, uh, would take some time. Um, do you think there would have been uh, the uh, impact on the current design tools that we have today if it hadn't been for our processes of working through those problems? Well, the whole industry, of course, went through it. Yes, everybody. I mean, the auto industry and besides. Mm. Well, as a, as a, the, the improvement in tools came along, so do we take advantage of it? But, I think, uh, I know we had a lot of, of uh, iterations with manufacturing and, and certainly on Apollo, uh, to a lesser degree on Orbiter, because we were learning. But uh, uh, I don't remember any really big, well, that's not true. <laughs> any, any, any major problems we didn't uh, uh, work with manufacturing to evolve a better place but you know like you said we were the shop was growing mm -hmm. shop was evolving different tools you know miracle tools of course Apollo or Orbiter we didn't even go to uh, CAD CAM until the middle of Orbiter yeah and so we were, we were you know we were still on the board on Apollo this is one of the comments I make to uh, the new generations of engineers and schools that are out there uh, our lack of the sophisticated tools of today was really, I feel, an asset to our skills and abilities to develop a program like Apollo. Uh, the danger of having 
these powerful tools of today where all you have to do is pick the app, push the button, and have it done is you don't understand what's behind that process, uh, the math, the geometry, the engineering. And so there's a danger that you begin to rely too much on the tool on the, for your on decision. The computer, the program. Exactly. When, when uh, IBM approached us on some of their new CAD CAM tools, and they came up with, well, we have a tool now where you can design the part and you can take it clear through qual testing just with the code in the computer. And there were too many of us that said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to build me one and I'm going to do it and test it in the lab. Uh, I, I hope, and from what we just saw yesterday, that some of the uh, uh, commercial industries uh, may have resolved that dilemma. SpaceX, uh, New Dragon, has been based on a lot of these new tools and, and the new generation of engineers. I've got, let's, let's take a couple of questions here before, because we're getting down on time here. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, would you talk about the Snoopy Award? You remember the Snoopy Award we had? I have two. Very good. Would you explain to uh, our audience what, what the Snoopy Award was? As I remember, it was a, uh, uh, award that was created by the, primarily by the astronauts, where they would, uh, on the spot, if you will, be able to award someone for an outstanding uh, contribution to the program. I believe that, does that encompass it? Yeah, I think so. Um, it was a very... They would uh, literally walk the floor. Yeah. And the astronauts would actually uh, present they them actually to the present. individual. Um, I, I guess the comment I would add to that was uh, after uh, uh, the Apollo 1 accident, NASA began to realize that uh, there was value in PR for uh, motivating uh, the people in terms of the program safety and so forth. So they had what they called the Men Flight uh, Awareness Program that was launched out of Houston. And... Uh, uh, we really embraced it here at Downey. I remember getting involved in it, and we had uh, we had programs like space craftsmanship. Uh, you were always everyone's part of the solution, uh, but everybody engaged in that, and it was a very powerful and rewarding program. And, and Snoopy, of course, was part. Doesn't of like it. to shake hands with an astronaut. That's right. I mean. You know, it's interesting that the astronauts, while they certainly uh, commanded their presence in terms of their careers and uh, uh, ethos or whatever, um, we did a couple of open houses, I remember, here at the, the plant. And on one occasion, after the open house the following workday, it was on a weekend or something, uh, I had called a staff meeting, and we, I asked him, I said, well, describe to me, uh, you know, what what'd your family say about, was one of the first times we had the families come in, what the families have to say about seeing the plant, the workspaces, and so forth. And I remember two comments. One was, uh, one of my engineers said, uh, well, they just thought that everybody who worked here at Downey was a genius. Pretty and, close. And I, <laughs> of course, that, that is true, I said, uh, right? But why would they say that? And they said, well, they just, every place they went, they saw nothing but stacks and stacks and stacks of paper and documents, and all of the boards in all of the rooms were filled with scribbles that nobody understood. Now, I'm going to say that half of that was project office stuff that was up there. But, yeah, they said uh, for the general public, it was, this was a, a fantasy land of, of the future. And, uh, and then the other comment was how, how proud they all felt that their parent or whoever the family member was worked there. And, and I guess that was one of the first times I realized that, uh, yes, uh, astronauts do have quite an aura about them, but so does everybody that worked on that program and built it. Okay, well, we'll wrap up with one question that I always say for the last. Of, uh, after all your experience, all these years, is there a lesson learned that you would like to share with the young people, the future audiences that are going to be going into aerospace? 
Well, number one, it's, uh, I think you have to go in with a, if the business continues like it, it has been, and we're continuing to evolve new things, you have to go into the attitude it's, uh, it's a, uh, a learning process all the way. And my, one thing I learned re really early was I continued to stay in school. I stayed in school for 10 years without any real goal in terms of a master's or anything, just getting good, uh, good uh, uh, classes that were applicable to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I think the second lesson I learned real, real well hard was that if you're going to be a, a manager in a system, you better listen. Better listen to everybody. Think, one, what you, if some guy tells you something, you better think about it. And the first time you ignore one of these guys, you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, first one gets you through the early phases of your career and growth. And the second one probably keeps you alive. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I've been asked this same question many, many times. And uh, I reiterate exactly what Ed has said in terms of learning is a lifetime, lifetime experience. We never stop. You stop learning, you die. It's as simple as that. Uh, so you want to continue learning. But uh, I had a group of electrical engineers graduating from Cal State Fullerton who asked me, one of the students asked me, well, what would you recommend as the most important thing to learn in school if you want to be an engineer? And my comment back to them, it's very simple. It's for anything you want to be. You must learn communication. Communication is number one. Listening is an extremely important part of that because without, without overcoming that communication barrier, you will never achieve anything, personally or uh, aerospace-wise or any-wise. If you're, if you're in school, take the things that you're passionate about, if it's math, if it's science, if it's engineering, learn about those things. But don't forget to learn about the communication part of that. Because you are going to be asked at some point in time to come and give a briefing to the chief engineer and tell him why your idea is the best idea out there. In spite of all of the people that he has that are telling him, no, that's no good. You don't want to do that. And if you want to be successful, that's the way you do it. Well, I think that uh, we're at the end of our interview. Ed, this has been a, a serious pleasure. You did a good job carrying me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, audience, for attending. Um, one last question. We had several watering holes here around the plant. <laughs> Most of them are missing. Most of them are missing. Did you have, what was your favorite watering hole? Curly's. Curly, that's not missing. It's it? now called Dixie Bell, uh, but it's still there. I, it's nothing what it was like when it was Curly's. Um, I have, a, I have a, an anecdotal statement goes that. I uh, I used to go there quite often, to say the least, and uh, I ran into a, 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 a busboy who uh, uh, I got to know, and he. Uh, was all the time studying when he wasn't buzzing. And so kept following him up anyway. Eventually, I got him a job here as a, a student worker. So he had a job here, which we had a program for at that time. And he had a, a he went to school full time or part time. Uh, net result is that young man is now the uh, sector chief engineer of. Uh, Man flight in uh, Northrop. Wow, that that's just so rewarding to know that. Uh, and that was one of three or four. See, it pays. It pays to visit those watering holes. <laughs> and boy, we needed it sometimes. Thanks again, Ed. Okay, thank you. Let me. Oh, thank you.